Hello everyone and welcome to episode 18 of the Nurtured by Nature podcast. Today I'm delighted to be joined in conversation by the sensational Erica Wheeler of Sense of Place Consulting. During this inspiring episode, we discuss how many of us will find ourselves feeling out of place and uprooted at some point during our lives, and why connection to the world around us is just so important, and how by finding a way to belong, we can allow the ancestry of the places we inhabit to weave their magical stories into our own unique tapestries of life. We also challenge the concept of utilising negativity to evoke responsibility and explore the power of story to build the bridges of connection in our search for meaning that help leave a lasting imprint and inspire both love and the reasons to care. From my own experience, I know it's very easy to feel depressed by the negative dialogues we are constantly bombarded by but Erica's wisdom is simple yet profound. Ask yourself, does it make it better living in despair? Don't complicate it. Your only job is to tune into love and express this. Hello everyone and welcome Erica. It's uh, really lovely to have you joining us today. I like to just start off um, these episodes of the Nurtured by Nature podcast by asking my guests a little bit about their nature story and how nature has been a part of your life, um, if that's evolved over time. And yeah, just if there's anything about nature that you would like to share, how it's influenced you over the years. Hello, everyone. Yes, my nature story. So I grew up in the suburbs outside of Washington, D.C. And um, it was an older suburb. So we had big trees and oh, beautiful. nature around, it seemed, in between the houses, even though it was the suburbs. And so my earliest memories are sort of just being entranced and enchanted by, by you know, it could even be like the spit of dirt between the sidewalk and the street. You know, I could yeah. just spend hours um, playing there. And when i was a a teenager um and i i was sort of really struggling with all of the the social environment and okay. cliques and all okay. of that school can be and um i think that's when it really it really came to me i was also learning about forests and ecosystems and all of that and and it, it really came to me about how um when I was in the forest, there wasn't any judgment, you know, yeah. that we were all just part yeah. of an ecosystem. And so that was, that was really a profound moment for me understanding. So, you know, the canopy has this and the forest floor has this and it's all working together. And I feel like that was a great, a great transformational lesson. And after that, I went on to, um, to doing more like we always went camping and like I said I have natural affinity with the outdoors but then I found a social group with the Audubon Youth Society oh, okay oh wow in my area yeah so that we we were bird nerds and it made me <laughs> want to it made me want to go on and be a wildlife biologist which I didn't become but we can circle back to that yeah but, sure <laughs> So after you, you obviously didn't become the wildlife biologist. So, but you're still, you're still involved with nature in a way now, aren't you? You work with a lot of the national park services and conservation um, places in the US helping them. Do you want to talk a little bit more into, into what you do now? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so being a bird nerd and then I remember this moment, um, where we were watching birds on the shore when I was young with this group and um and shore birds are so awesome for younger people because they're so rewarding you know you can see them yeah. so easily and um and I remember turning around and seeing this um plaque with this with a quote on it by Aldo Leopold and it said there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot it always makes me cry oh, wow. and it felt like that was my tribe that was my calling was yeah. that there are some who can and some who cannot yeah. and um and so that kind of carved my way and so I did I wanted to study animal behavior but there was a time where I, I just um 
I did some field research and when I was supposed to present that to my supervisor, um, I lived out in Colorado, I got a scholarship and I studied marmots and pikas. And I remember trying to present this to my, um, my supervisor, Misha Flom, who was from Russia. And he kept asking me, um, can you prove it? Can you prove it? Oh, and at, okay. I, at some point I was just like, it just feels true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that was yeah. the moment I realized maybe I'm not I'm not going to be a scientist, but I have a deep appreciation for scientific inquiry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so fast forward, I went in college, I, I sort of studied many things, and it was all centered around this idea of sense of place, which is my work today. But I, I went on to be a touring songwriter using oh, wow. stories and connections to place and how places can teach us about ourselves and what how we impact places. And then fast forwarding through that, I touring for several decades on the road and just kind of being heartbroken by all the rapid development yeah. in the 90s to so just places I loved became that were irreplaceable um, yeah. were replaced yeah. by kind of generic malls and things and and it was crushing to me and um and so my the cd that I made in 2008 I partnered with a a land trust organization, the Nas the trust, the trust for public land. I know you have wonderful land trusts and such where you are yeah. as well. And I felt like that's a way to really make a difference. You know, it's like you, you draw the line in the sand and you say, we're going to protect this and take care of this. Yeah. So I partnered with them. And then at a land trust event, a trust for public land event, I met someone who said, you should work with these people who are all the people that give the tours at parks okay. and yep. museums. So that's how it unfolded. I think having this sort of sense of belonging and it, it allows you to feel like more of a responsibility for a place, doesn't it? And, you know, you've, you deepen that connection to where you are or the things that are important to you and, and then you you feel like you want to protect them. And I think that's so important, isn't it today? In, in like you were just touching on the, the places that you loved, that you saw being developed and lost. And I guess that's that sort of feeds into your work now, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, you're so right. That sense of belonging was really what was the start of it all because I felt like I would be touring and I would be singing these songs about loss of places or connections to places, you know sort of embedded in relationship stories and the prose and all of that, but that's what they were kind of about. Um, and people would come up to me with stories and I was like, people people totally feel connected and care, but they don't know how to act on that caring sometimes. That's why I had chosen Land Trust as a, as a good way to take action local or farther. But um, yeah, it's sort of originated from my own sense of exclusion and not belonging and where it was, you know, from not only the teenage cliques, but also society at large, you know, we were one of the only Jewish families in the neighborhood where I grew up. And um, there was a sense of exclusion from like country clubs that didn't allow people at that time who were Jewish or african-american or anything else that was different yeah. um so that was like at the end of my street you know was um was one of those and then yeah so there's different times in my life where i felt that and i my solution you know changing the world and taking action is great if not immediate <laughs> yeah. and so my solution was to find personal links to places where I could find personal connections. And so that all weaves back into everyone has these stories of connection. I can talk more about that, but that's that's the heart of it is is finding that sense of belonging wherever you are. And and now I see it so necessary as people are more dislocated and more removed by choice or not. They come to a place and they're like, well, I'm not from here. You know, yeah. so that sense of ownership and connection and stewardship and responsibility gets tossed to the wayside. Yeah, that's it's really I think for more and more of us, it's there's, you know, as we sort of entered this more like global society that we have, we don't have the roots that we we would have used to have in generations past, do we, where people had, you know, sort of, you know, their parents and grandparents and so forth had, had been rooted in in place and there you know we often move a lot more and and it is 
it's hard to to find that that sense of sort of rooting and and belonging isn't it um yeah it, yeah yeah so it's um yeah it's and so many people don't know you know they were uprooted against their will you know the the enslavement that we had in the united states but they a lot of people grieve for not knowing who their ancestors are mm -hmm. and then many people that are just uprooted and had to leave for other reasons and so i'm all about like what how can you feel that deep sense of belonging where you are right now um because that's that's what's needed um i think that the links to the ancest ancestry traditions and the past are wonderful to discover and and if you don't have them and you don't know them um you can still belong to where you are just by being a human being on the planet <laughs> yeah that and um do you so you run um sort of courses that uh, specifically facilitate people um finding that that sense of belonging yeah so i i i did that you know when i was a touring musician and I would be in a new town every day and I wanted to feel a connection. And I started to develop a process, a way of like finding my sense of place there, you know, different things that I would do. And, um, and then when, so then after I met that person that said, you should work with these guys at these parks, it started, it started a, um, it started a trajectory of going and working, working with, the, a lot with the National Park Service, like you said, and a lot with land trusts and state parks and now museums. Um, but when COVID happened and I was um, not allowed to travel like everyone else in the world, and I was seeing everyone saying that they were grounded and how much they didn't want to be where they were. And some people were stuck where they were. And I thought, oh, I can help. I can help people um, feel connected to where they are. I have tools and practices that can help. And so I just, I offered, at that time, it was a free seven-day challenge called Grounded in Place. Oh, wow, okay. And um, and that gave people tools and practices right where they were to feel that that kind of belonging and connection. So that was amazing. And there were so many amazing stories that came out of that um, challenge everything from tad and colorado who had just you know had had some heart surgery a couple times and there's a practice where i'm like you know feeling feeling all your senses about the place and then feeling your heart and he's like oh, this is the first time i felt in my heart you know oh, for wow. right so like yeah. that wow it, well it's giving it, me goosebumps that that just yeah wow yeah. 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 And then another to someone who had just gotten a job at a nature center, she was totally stoked to do. And she was grounded at home. And she wrote about like connection to the water, like in a ditch by a field in a farm. And I was like, you know, so it can be done. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then um, is is writing like is quite an important aspect of that? Do you find that really helps people? deepen into those conversations and feelings yeah so um covid happened and i slowed down and 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 it was good to create the curriculum that so out of that grounded in place program people wanted to do more and so i was like what can i do and i created a course or i called it at that time creative discovery just really the foundations of your stories and your connections and yeah. creative practices that help you do that and projects and things are super fun and then that led into the writing um and so yeah i developed this online creative writing sense of place writing kind of community and a series of courses and um yeah and that continued and the training paused and and now it's starting to to rev up again as sites are having more staff on site and can do hiring can do programs um, but now I find I have two businesses that I'm running. So the inner work, the creativity, the reflection, the integration, the personal experience, and then that work of working in the public, in the field and helping them find their stories. Um, but I truly think it's for, it's, it's not just for writers. It's really, I was thinking this morning before our talk that it's kind of like from soul seekers to scientists. It's like everyone can find those stories yeah and I think um 
I think there's, there's a, actually I was I think it was on your website I was just reading um you said facts and data change mind but stories change change hearts I think that's what it said and um I just love that because I think it is like like you're saying it does appeal to scientists as well because they they can be some of the most passionate people can't they scientists but sometimes they just get a bit knotted up in like their sort of facts and data and like you know the average person starts to glaze over because it doesn't doesn't really resonate with them so actually yeah helping them to to find the way to present their what they're passionate about and what they're discovering in story allows them to really connect with people that can support particularly in the natural world support their work for conservation and it yeah so it's it is um it's an amazing skill and i think it's it's something that we've sort of lost a little bit haven't we as a society like story used to be really important and now it's it sort of it's got a bit lost with the sort of I guess the, the technology and you know everything's condensed and you know the 280 character tweets and things it's it's harder and harder isn't it but um yes yeah, it's, it's an important an important skill and can just help us make such a difference can't it um yeah it's um it's it's really it's it's actually it's really fascinating to watch like people who have a lot of knowledge and capacity trying to circle around and explain something and and as they circle around they finally land on something that's an easy metaphor you know an easy analogy an easy understanding and um and then they have that as a connector and so and that's really effective like to be able to have all that knowledge and you can see it in you can see it boil down in in people they'll talk 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 talk, talk and then here's the thing you know like i remember somebody talking about the planets and like it's all in your hand and they had described it or there's just different ways of coming down to the story the what it is and um it's true we we lived through the information age and um, and then into the age of experience, I think is what it, it's called and people wanting to have those experiences, but people can be a bridge between information and experiences. And that bridge is most easily crossed with story. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does yeah. definitely. Um... I mean, it kind of, it goes back to like, that's how knowledge was passed on, wasn't it? You know, before the written word really was, it was all in myth and story and yeah, it's, it's just, it, it's powerful, isn't it? It's a powerful way of teaching and sharing. Um, yeah, I think it was, yeah, it was passed down. And, and I think, you know, like I said, my appreciation for methods of scientific inquiry, I mean, I think. I think that's the trend is is helping people have a method of inquiry, you know, not us telling people, but having ways for them to check it out and figure it out and find their own um, connection and meaning. And instead of just being fed the information and it's right or it's wrong, that is that's just coming to me now that like that's the skill is um, it's not so much being a critical thinker, but having inquiry and curiosity yeah curiosity <laughs> yeah that's that's it isn't it it's um you know being being some someone sharing something but you're actually sort of like curious to learn more and delve deeper and yeah yeah which reminds me i'm curious about you <laughs> and i see um elephants and giraffes and um tell me something more about your connection to all of this oh well yeah so i um i went off to well i i grew up um listening to documentaries and david attenborough and was absolutely um fascinated by african wildlife and um and then sort of after school i, I managed to save enough money and i went off to africa and um actually just ended up working out there um running a safari lodge in a game reserve and i came home sort of for the well i, I didn't come home at all basically <laughs> for like five years and then um yeah so it's it's um africa and and that that's interesting as well when we were talking about sense of place because actually when i first landed in africa and i was 
20, I actually felt more at home than I had anywhere else in my life. Um, despite the fact that I'd never set foot on the continent before, I just remember literally sort of my feet touched the sort of hot African soil and the smell and everything. And it just like in my soul, I was like, oh, I've come home. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I was listening to you talking about a sense of place and a sense of belonging and how actually traveling across the other side of the world, I felt more belonging and more at home and connection um and i think that sort of that touches on your own childhood doesn't it of of you saying like um your own experience is finding your your own place in feeling out of place when you were in sort of your teenage years um, yeah i think travel can really activate it right like you it activates that that sense and um and and then also i think having having mentors and guides that help with that. Like I've worked with in urban places and with youth and such where, they're, where they'll give them the experience of being out in nature, or being out somewhere. And um, sometimes there's a little bit of a like, how do we, how do we, how do we relate to this? How do we get to this? And, um, and sometimes there's just that immediate, like I remember like some at risk youth that it was in California and they were actually like not, you know, not exactly free <laughs> and um and that they were like i feel free here and just yeah. you know with the sky and the trees and all of that so to offer that respite that experience for a little while and then hopefully find be able to find it where you live somehow yeah yeah it's um i think it's i think it's important isn't it for people who i think growing up in an urban environment actually allowing people to have the opportunity to spend time in nature they do discover like a whole different part of themselves and i think right at the beginning you touched on it um in your sort of story about nature is that it it's a place where you can find support and you know the sort of and not you're not judged either are you it's it's a completely different experience from being in a sort of urban environment surrounded by people feeling like they're they're judging you whether you fit in or your, yeah. you know, like you, you said about if you're the right religion or the right skin color, or, you know, you don't get any of that in nature. It's you, I guess it's, it's, um, sort of a, a level playing field for everyone, isn't it? You, I think yeah. that connection to earth. And I mean, I, I feel, and maybe, I don't know if everyone feels this way, but I think people do that it, it's, it, it you may not always feel this connection to the natural world, but there's a, a way of attuning to it, right? So, like I said, growing up in the suburbs, but I'm always attuned to what's the sky, what are the clouds, what are the wind, what is growing here? I mean, I'm very attuned to where I am and what is around me, you know, and I'm especially, I'm thinking of like I worked on the National Wall in Washington, D.C., which is where all the monuments are. And just like thinking about all these built, these these monuments that and, and the built environment that have ideas and stories embedded in them. And then watching like birds fly over and knowing, oh, they're following the Potomac River and they're migrating. Like I knew where I was. And part of that was because I'd gone up in the monument and seen the whole view. And I'm like, oh, that's where this is. And so um, that's that's a tip for your listeners is just finding a point of view, you know, that that gives you a lay of the land wherever you are and that helps you make sense of it. Yeah. And I guess that find you can identify your place in it then as well, can't you, where you are at that at that point anyway, obviously your place can change. Yeah. Yeah. You identify your place in it. And um, and I. I think it leads you to like, I'm, I've heard a lot of um, indigenous speakers here talk about there's this idea of getting in nature or being in nature as not being part of the concept of how they experience it. And I think that's similar to how I experience it is that we're always in it. We're always in nature, yeah. you know, and, and that you can find that. And I think it's equally as fascinating um, to know where I am in place and to know about the built environment, to know what's here and why it's here. And um, 
yeah, to just find a viewpoint and go, oh, my, this is like my dad mentored me this way. He was like, instead of telling us why something was there, he would say, yeah, why do you think this town is here? And, um, you know, let's go, let's go look. And, oh, there's a river. Why do you think that, how do you think that might've helped this town? And so that's, that's the other way of learning about a place is, is following that curiosity for your, your built environment. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, it's important. I think there is like this tendency for um, people to be portrayed as like, you know, the sort of evil part and like, you know, the only hope for the world is if we wipe ourselves off of it. And actually it's quite important to to realise that we're a part of it as well and and how we can find our sort of our place in it again rather than feeling separate from it we need to integrate back into it a lot more don't we and and like you say whether and that can be in the urban environment i mean we've got lots of urban environments we need we can't sort of turn our back on them can we we need to integrate them into to nature as well yeah yeah to feel at home in a in a place wherever you are is going to be in between nature at least um and finding that sense of curiosity. And I, I think we're also in this really interesting time of maybe at one time we needed, you know, it's kind of like when we were children, we needed to have people we looked up to and thought, oh, they know, and they did good things and they're better than us. But now we see them as humans with their own failings. And I feel like at one time we needed to lift up, you know, other people and, and put, put identities on them like these are the heroes or these are the whatever and now we're at a time where we can look at everything and say there's good and bad in everyone and we can look at places and say this you know I think it's about intention you know mm-hmm. um that it's about that so Europe is a lot older than the United States and I feel like many times during different periods, things were built with great intention. Like we're going to make this as with the guild of all the artisans that we can and make this as beautiful as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, rather than the, you know, the development post fifties, which is just like, we're going to make this as functional and fast. Yeah. Utilitarian, isn't it? Sort of. yeah. 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 And which is fine. I mean, people have lives and people, it, all of life happens in those functional environments, but they are not enhancing the place. Sometimes they're, um, they're generic. Yeah. yeah. It's not like I'm anti-development. I'm just that places, it should be intentional. Like we're going to do this here. So we don't do this here and it should it should be life enhancing. That's kind of my yeah, it can, life. It can sort of, it can feed your spirit, can't you? Um, you know, like like you were talking about Europe and some of the beauty and, you know, it's a sort of, it's a feast for the the senses and the eyes and, you know, it's, and and a lot of it, you know, a lot of it was, that they did take um, inspiration from the world around them, um, the shapes and forms that they saw in nature. Um, I think it's just a different pace of development, like things, you know, it's like where I live in the United States is New England. And, um, and so there's a lot of it that was built before the car. And so there's more winding and village greens and things like that, that feel more like community to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and community is so important. I think, I think it's something that we, and it's part of why you you did your courses during COVID. Like I think it's really hit home to a lot of people that um, we kind of we kind of took community for granted, didn't we? And and then being isolated through lockdowns and um, the pandemic, we've we've realised more and more that you know we we need community and it it has so much power in it. And yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm going to turn it back to you too, since we're building community here. Yeah. So you went to Africa and you had this sense of place and all these experiences. And then what happened? Um, <laughs> I, actually, yeah, I worked, I, so I worked um, in a lodge and it was, it was, um, 
it was quite full on. It was uh, very much like a 24 seven job. And um, I, I would sleep like, with a, a radio next to my bed. We were in quite an isolated. Uh, and when, when I say radio, I mean a, a two way communication radio. Um, we were in quite an isolated um, area. So it was important to have someone who was aware and you know just always on duty and and i did it for almost five years in a very isolated environment which was brilliant because i was surrounded by wilderness and but i just felt um a yearning to experience more of life i think and to travel further um so then i've i've gone on and i've traveled a lot more in in africa and now i'm back in the uk and i've done sort of wildlife photography and writing and yeah and oh. and it, and yeah, just all, <laughs> all sorts of things. I just, uh, I think I'm a lifelong learner and uh, very curious natured and, you know, want to, you know, there's f so many things fascinate me. So I, uh, I sort of delve in and, and learn as much as I can. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I still, I'm very much involved in uh, conservation and um, mm. of African species and, and also closer to home, the environment. And that's, yeah, I think that was, perhaps what Africa stirred in me was um, really sort of the the knowledge and information to sort of understand the importance of, of needing to to support the natural environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because um, when I was a teen, I, I did this thing called National Outdoor Leadership School, which is a, an expedition, and I had wanted to go to Africa. Um, you know, Jane Goodall, all that. Yeah. Right? And, uh, <laughs> and I'd wanted to go to Africa and um, maybe it was the cost. I can't remember, but I ended up going out West to the wilderness out there and, and the expedition started in Yellowstone. But, and I do often wonder, gosh, how would the trajectory of my life changed if I had done the Africa trip? <laughs> um, but it, it started this, you know, love affair with the American West. And um, yeah, I think about it you know, like that feeling of going to sleep, knowing that these pretty much intact corridors and ecosystems are surrounding me is just such a amazing, rare, wonderful feeling. Yeah, it's it's a really special experience. And I mean, we we are quite lucky that there are still these places in the world, aren't there, where you can have this real, like, a wilderness experience and it it is it's it gives you a different perspective on life i think um and a different connection to the world around you and like you said like you know laying in bed and you know you can see the stars because there's no light pollution and you are much more in touch with the seasons and the the weather and the environment and how that influences the community that you're sharing it with in terms of the wildlife and the the trees and plants and insects yeah yeah and it's a treasure and if you haven't experienced that um that's why it's so important to safeguard what there is so that not everyone can experience it you know different times you know different abilities but that you can experience some of that it's like safeguarding it for when you can you know yeah. um that's it needs to be safeguarded and i sometimes i think of it uh, when i so i had the chance when i was young too to go I, I lived in denmark for a little bit and went to school and i um and i took a trip and i got to go to paris and to notre dame i haven't been back overseas for many decades but i did then but the reason i'm telling you this story is that um so i i grew up jewish i have jewish heritage and um and so christianity is sort of over there and different for me but i remember going to paris and walking into notre dame and going wow i get it <laughs> Like that was as amazing to me as yeah. a wilderness experience. Like it was built for such expression. And I mean, I'm sure it, ha it has other implications and the church and all, whatever, all that. But there's also this sense of awe and spirit and wonder that yeah. you 
feel filled with, I think, you know, when you when you go there to places mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, and it's well, that comes back to your, I think you mentioned earlier, intention as well, doesn't it? And, and I think we, as well as finding our sense of place, like we also leave a sense of ourselves in a place, don't we? And so we leave that kind of our imprint and our intention and our emotion on a place. Mm. And, uh, and that I guess, and probably more so in the built environment as well, you know, because that's obviously something that, you know, people have had their hands on and, you know, they envisaged, they imagined, they brought into life. And um, yeah, we, I, I think yeah. you, can, you feel that, don't you, when you go somewhere? Um, yeah. Yeah, I love that you're bringing that back around. I mean, I'm thinking to that body of work that I did in college. So I went to Hampshire College, which is here in, um, in Amherst, Massachusetts. It's a very alternative kind of college where you design your own major, basically, and you do projects called divisions. It was a wonderful school for someone like me that doesn't love to test. I mean, I, I don't test well, but I could tell you a story and everything I know, you know, but I'm like, um, so it was a wonderful place for me to go. But, but the bulk of my work was a project called a sense of self, a sense of place. And it was an exploration of how do we affect places and how do places affect us, you know? So it, that's, it, that's where all of this, you know, came into, came together. Um, but okay. So where are we going? So you're our imprint. Yeah. And how we leave that too. Yeah. So I think it's, um, I imagine if people haven't explored these kinds of ideas, they're just moving through the world and it's just moving through the world. There's not a, there's not an inquiry and curiosity about why is this here and what does this mean? And, you know, how, how do, how does this all, how do I fit here? There's just a, they're just kind of moving through the world for their own uses. So that's what the story and all the work is really about. It's um, it's about what's the personal meaning for you of being here, you know, and that's so beyond like the selfie and the bucket list, you know, that's, it's really, it's like, no, really, what does it, what does it mean for you to stand here and see this, you know, like, I just think that kind of inquiry that my dad did with me, it's like, well, why, what, why do you like this place? What is, you know, like he was m mentoring me to think that way. He was a journalist. Yeah, um, okay. so maybe that's why, but, um, but yeah, full of so, curiosity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And when I work with park interpreters and museum guides, you know, I think, you know, that kind of um, tuning in and asking questions um is so important rather than giving information to just kind of get the own person thinking so that story making is really important and that idea of reflection and integration it's really important and i i think without that you you may not be it may not be top of mind why you why a place feels good to you why it might be helpful for others to also feel that yeah, I think um, we're so we're sort of so busy in our lives and and sort of rushing with things, don't we? That you know, I mean, like you you mentioned the, the bucket list, and it's like you know there is this sort of um, I'm I mean I'm sure like the national parks in in America are the same. People are like, oh, I want I've got to go to here, and it's <laughs> just to tick it off. And they're like, you know, oh, well, I've only got this little amount of time and rush in, and I've got to go and see every little bit in it. And I say, oh, I've been to this, I've been to this, I've been to this, and you you don't actually experience it then, do you? You're you're you know you need to have that ability to slow down and yeah, just just sort of take a moment and to sort of be somewhere don't you it's really important yeah the power of presence um i mean people come into it there's a lot of you know research on travel motivations and visitor motivations and what what people are seeking and why they take a journey you know so i think before we're talking about kind of the built environment and that might be where we grew up or home or where we go but seeing places and sites and, and things like that, like different motivations to learn, to be social. But more and more, there's been research that 
people today really are looking for meaning making experiences. And so that's where it's like, there's the thing, and then there's what the thing can mean. And so kind of examining what that is, you know, like learning, learning about something and what it is and how it was built or how many bricks or whatever, where they come from. But, but then it's like, oh, there's so many rich stories that can be found and why those stones or why it was built that way or what that meant, you know, then that whole exploration I find is just so, there's a lot of practices that are like filling your mind or thinking about other thoughts or whatever. But I think the most like mindfulness, healing, present making thing to do is to, is to be present where you are and boost your curiosity about that place. And that is you connecting to a place, connecting to the world. And, you know, when we're talking about nature and the planet, it's whatever you consider the creator. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it goes that big. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, I mean, when you're working with, I mean, because tourism in Africa, um, I, I talk from my experience there, tourism is hugely important in preserving, um, providing enough income for these wild places to be preserved. And, you know, particularly a lot of the countries are economically still developing. They don't have a huge amount of money. So by having tourists come and visit, it's it's a way of, of preserving them both internationally and locally for the, the local populations to, to have their own natural um, heritage preserved and and I would assume in, in America it's, it's a similar thing like tourism is is a, a very important part of, of these parks income so that they can continue to preserve them so um, how do you help the I, I mean you, you've got a history in conservation as well haven't you so like, I guess you're you're quite uniquely placed with I mean it's quite an interesting transect of your your music career your passion for conservation and your love of of story to come together to help these these places basically give give them a, a better chance of survival I suppose really um yeah yeah that they're not just kind of like you said you know, places to snap a picture and go. Um, I guess that comes back to caring. I mean, my purpose for doing the work originated out of that, you know, when I wanted to be a wildlife biologist, it was like, I said, oh, if people just, if we just knew what to do, um, then we would take care of places, <laughs> right? So it was like more science, more information. If we just knew and people knew that, oh, that's what you need to do, then we would do it. But that of course wasn't enough. And so then it became, but well, people need to find a reason to care. And that's where the stories, you know, came out of and, and the story sharing and the story evoking. Um, and, and I think that spreads to caring about the larger you know like maybe i'll never go to africa does it matter deeply to me that um that the 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 wildlife and all of that is there so maybe i would someday does it matter deeply to me that people have enough to eat and enough to survive on that they don't have to go take from what that small little patch that we have yes that matters deeply to me too um and so, yeah, it's complicated, um, but it matters deeply that we take care of what we choose. And I know so often there's places, you know, natural places like that, and you make choices and some are multiple uses and boundaries are drawn in different ways and it can get complicated. And I also just bring that into the built environment. You know, it's like sometimes we can't save every town or every building and we can choose this is representative or this is especially meaningful and um and here's why you know or even when we're choosing now to say we're gonna not take we're gonna take that story down because we don't we don't want to live with that in our face you know that there's different ways to do that or have it be an object for you know thought-provoking understanding of where we were and where we are now yeah and the 
the possible um I don't know mistakes may be too strong a word but perhaps the mistakes that we've made or you know how history how we've learned I perhaps that's how we've evolved and learned and and you know we can't we can't wipe out our history but we can learn from it and we can move on and and sometimes like those monuments are important for passing on ensuring that knowledge is, is continued that that evolution continues and we've we learned from the things that we could have done better yeah it's complicated but I, I feel like that's kind of the edge and that's um, like my work with parks and museums and places that hold these stories and share these stories is, is all about now, it's about developing the skills for telling complicated stories, right? Like, um, you know, in, we've increased our knowledge and then we, uh, we can um, remember, recover, understand um, other stories and other, you know, narratives and how to weave those together in a way that's concise and, um, and comprehensible and, um, and clear, you know, and that takes skill and, and art, you know, it's like, we're changing the way we think about nature and history and culture. And it takes people who want to do that reflective, integrative work, um, so that it can be communicated. It's like, how we started by saying sometimes stories are known and passed down and and then when you've when you've lived through um those stories and then you're like no not all that's not true and all that you know that you begin to create interwoven narratives that allow for paradox and possibility i don't know if this goes on the direction that you wanted to go in with yeah, talking no. about nature no. in our lives but i just feel like you know my my desire is that more people care about places and 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 have experiences of connection to places and that means natural wild places and urban places and everything in between yeah yeah no it's it's um it's just fascinating. I think one of the things about what I I feel is that we we do need to start exploring ourselves as much as the natural world, and you know, having compassion for ourselves and and you know how we found ourselves here. Like you know, we have to sort of look at our you know our environment and our culture and you know we are where we are now and we have to be like you know just recognize that and then it's by recognizing where we've come from where we are and where we want to be is is an important you know it's that's as important for us and humanity as it is for nature and the environment yeah it's kind of like um i think other people use this analogy too it's like when you're young you can do whatever you want and you know you can eat whatever you want or sleep however long you want you can do whatever you want and when you're get to be an adult you have to have some like oh if i do this it has that effect and um and so i think now we're at that as a as a planet we're in that adult phase of um oh we're gonna have to make some choices here because yeah. if we do that then it does that yeah. and so that is about sort of us, all of us coming to what matters and what we value and um, reflecting on that. And I want to just lead to that. Like, I will tell you, there became a time where I was, oh, I, I just was so tired of all the pleas and the, um, you know, join this and pay this and, yeah. you know, the pleas that came with everything is bad and ending and all gone now, you know? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and now that's not as motivating right. as just sort of um yeah it was it was it didn't it wasn't as motivating for me I guess it made me feel a sense of powerlessness and I think that many people that's what I was saying with the why I worked with the land trust many people are like well what can I do or how can what I do matter and so there's different ways to have an impact and I believe that it's, you know, the work of crafting um, a poem or a little story that expresses why you love some place is equally as valuable as somebody who's in the position to make a donation to a conservation yeah. organization or donate some land that, 
it does take all of us in making an impact where we can, wherever we are in our lives. Well, I think um, I love that. And I think that's sort of a, almost a beautiful place to start rounding up. And But it came back to, you said a word earlier, which was interwoven. And it just, as you were talking now, I was thinking of a tapestry. And I was thinking of all the different colored threads and all the different stitches and then, and how that's all of us. And we all need to do what is our part of it, don't we? And I think that's the work that you you're doing is helping people find what who they are and where their place is and what their part is and which little stitch they're going to be in what color they're going to be in and i think that's that is important and everyone's contribution is important and that's something that really is is very important to me and my heart and what you've just said as well about you know it's there is so much negativity that we're bombarded with and you know, you do feel hopeless and particularly if you care about it, it, it feels overwhelming and it feels, you know, disempowering. You, you feel like I can't do anything. It's too late. I'm being told all of the time. It's too late. There's nothing I can do. And I love I, so I loved what you just said. It's just brilliant that, um, you know, just do what you can. And, you know, if that's like, I mean, you've you've obviously you've had lots of things that you've done, like your your songwriting and and also your work now as but it that I mean even that just shows like the diversity of things that people can do and how they can contribute and yeah just I think that's lovely <laughs> yeah there was I think it was an Abraham Hicks who was like a spiritual teacher but she was being asked the um yes their channels um she was being asked um she was someone was talking to her about their grief for polar bears and how could all of this inner work possibly help polar bears and kind of their despair which I have of course yeah. you yeah. know it's like my dream to see a polar bear but um, um but she was saying well does does it make it better for the polar bear if you are living in the despair you know and it's and it's like I think having it and acknowledging it and having having the time to feel those feelings when they come up is really important and taking action you know that both that both matter but i think a lot of our work ahead especially with the changing i'm calling it i call it climate instability yeah it's not just change it's instability that's the problem um that, that there's you know we're all gonna have grief and loss and change and it's important to have that and have resilience to come back and i guess what i want to end with is just my approach is to tune into the love like i love i would love to see a polar bear i love that whole world and environment and i want to see it thrive and you know you know, so maybe that means I'm, I'm, I have this tea I drink that's from the Inuit people. Oh, that, okay. Yeah. 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 I was like, oh, I just, you know, I just love drinking that tea and it's all responsibly sourced and ethical yeah. and supports them. And so little yeah. actions like that, um, that help my love and concern. Um, yeah, yeah, just be expressed. It just makes, it just makes it, it makes it better somehow. Cause I've been in that place of, hopelessness and despair and um and i and i really think the practice of loving whatever you can love as a daily practice yeah. is what sustains us yeah no I, oh that's that's beautiful erica really like <laughs> it's just yeah so it's sort of almost made like all the in a nice way all like the hairs on the back of my neck stand up just <laughs> it, is, it is but it is it's just it is find what what you love isn't it find what you love and and how you can cherish that and how you can find inspiration from that and how you can be responsible for protecting that whatever that may be whether that's you know the tree and the bird in your garden or you know it's like like you love your polar bears or you know and even your even your community you know being caring in your community in the built environment and and nurturing other people so that they can find that space to find the things that they love as well. I mean, that's important as well. So. And it's like, yeah, it's like taking the space, like, don't you love that? You know, like, yes, there's laws and actions and all of that, 
I think that's sometimes I say I'm this I'm the lifestyle, you know, and cooking section of the newspaper. I'm not <laughs> the news yeah. because there's lots of people that are do, can do the news, but I'm yeah. like I just want to help people. Like, do don't you love that? Yeah, and um, that's my section. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love. Well, I'd be I'd be the first, that would be the section I'd flip to. Don't you love that? <laughs> oh, yeah. it's so nice to talk with you. Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Erica. It's been an absolute pleasure to explore a little bit more about what you do and, and how people can find a sense of place. And I will include your, your website details. So if people want to explore a bit more about what you do and, and reach out to you, then, then they can. Yeah. And let me just clarify that. So I have ongoing online writing classes that are for any level of experience, sense of place writing. And then I also work with, um, with sites that have visitor programs and I help them with their tours. So that's interpretation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would love to connect with people who have an affinity for all of this. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, lovely. Well, thank you so much, Erica, for your time today. And, thank um, you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you so much for listening to the Nurtured by Nature podcast. I truly hope this conversation has brought some hope and inspiration into your life. I would love to have these messages ripple out across the world. So if you can, please share this episode with your friends, leave a review on your favourite podcast player and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. I would love to hear from you, so please feel free to connect with me on the links provided in the podcast description. But most importantly, thank you so much for being a part of this journey with me. But don't forget to simply get out there and enjoy the natural world.